tell them, Roberta, those dogs are going to kill somebody. But who listens to me, right? Nobody. Oh, come on in and have a seat. You know, they just bark like that when there's strangers around. We don't get many visitors here. <sighs> Sit down. Make yourself comfortable. <sighs> you know, Roberta never had kids of her own. So those dogs are her babies. She spoils them rotten. Would you believe they actually eat at the kitchen table with her? In chairs at the table. Pork chops, beef roast, hamburger. Water. Oh no, she puts the water on the floor in the bowl. <laughs> no, no, may I have some water? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry. My, my manners are right out the freaking window. I'm nervous, I gotta tell you. You coming all the way out here, flying across the country? I, well, I've waited for this day so long, and now that you're here, I, I just can't hardly believe it. Neither can I. <laughs> you know, my whole life could change in the next 30 seconds. I mean, I'm actually shaking. I think I'm having a seizure. Oh. So who's your friend outside? The driver. We'll bring him in. The dogs have persuaded him to stay in the car. Oh, well, I don't want him waiting out there by himself. Oh, I told you I was nervous. <laughs> Trust me, this won't take long. Oh. Okay, well, here you go. Are you sure you wouldn't like a little something extra to go with your water? No, I'm working. Well, it'll take the edge off. I'll keep the edge on if you don't mind. <laughs> okay. Oh, do you have any trouble finding the place? Actually, yes, the uh, address to the trailer park didn't show up on the navigational system of the limo. <laughs> That's us, off the beaten path. So how was your flight? I'm here. Hey, what was the movie? No movie. All the way from New York and no movie, huh? I'm afraid not. Damn airlines, you know they're cutting everything. I flew to Des Moines to see my cousin Franny because of her gallbladder. They charged me for a pillow. Can you believe that? A freaking pillow! I mean, next you know they'll be running your credit card every time you go to the toilet. But don't get me started. What did you fly? It sounds like Delta. Well, the Foundation has its own jet. Oh. Shall we get down to business? Yeah, okay. The Foundation has assigned me as the consulting expert on your case. I am, of course, Lionel Percy. Maude Gutman. You know who I am. Oh, yeah. I hit the freaking jackpot. There's a long list of small-time, mediocre experts. Oh, I'm sure. I'm not on that list. <laughs> you know, I really have to thank you. For, for taking my case and flying all the way out here. I mean, a busy, important man like you, you must have better things to do. You have no idea. So why do you think they assigned you to my painting? Well, I teach abstract expressionalism at Princeton University. Prior to that, for 12 years, I served as curator, then director, for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's in New York City. After that, for seven years, I was editor-in-chief of Connoisseur Magazine. I don't think I've ever read that. Indeed. <laughs> in addition to teaching, I also serve on the board of the Whitney, the Frick, and the Museum of Modern Art. I'm a lecturer, the author of several books, two on Times bestseller list. Whoa. Many are now considered classic texts. Mm -hmm. The uh, history of art in Western civilization, the chronology of modern art in America, the symbolist aesthetic of abstract expressionalism. Art for dummies. <laughs> hey, can I get you a beer? No, thank you. Oh, shit, I almost forgot. I made us a little something. Are you hungry? No. It, it's nothing fancy. I was about to say. It's just a little nibble. <coughs> well, the Foundation for yeah, Art Research little, you know, what you call it. is an internationally known 
Ta da! Go ahead, help yourself. They're little weenie rolls. I made them myself. With Velveeta and without. Perhaps later. Okay. Well, should I uh, bring in the painting? The paperwork first, shall we? Okay. Among its many goals, the Foundation for Art Research strives to prevent the circulation of forged and misattributed or misappropriated art. Proving forgeries is a personal crusade of mine. I like to consider myself a fake buster. But, but my painting is not a fake. Well, if you're an expert, then what am I doing here? Well, I need you. How flattering. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> the Foundation draws on a global community of art experts and scholars of global eminence, that would be me, mm -hmm. to provide expertise to the public, that would be you, to uh, verify authenticity of works of art. You know, we only accept a few of these cases each year. We have hundreds of applications from all over the world, but few are chosen. Well, then you must really think my painting is real. Um, this is your application. Yeah. The two color photographs that you provided of the painting. Yep. A photocopy of the non-refundable deposit. The balance of the full fee is here. Okay. Um, the name on your check, he is... Oh, that's my brother. I see. Yeah, I don't have the money for any of this. Is there a Mr. Gutman? Oh, there was. <laughs> was? He's gone. Dead? Let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long have you lived here at uh, Sagebrush Trailer Park? Ooh, let's see, 33 years. Oh. By yourself? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes not. <laughs> Occupation? Bartender. Of course. Well, I was. I see. They fired me. I, I quit, actually. You're certainly not the standard art collector that I typically encounter. This is me, pal. Yes, I hardly see you sipping Dom Perignon with Diane von Furstenberg, <laughs> evaluating to Kunig. No, I'd rather stay home with a six-pack and watch Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> Can I get the damn painting now? Now, first I will need you to sign this agreement. What does it say? It says that you fully understand that my job is to render an objective and professional um, opinion on the authenticity of the painting, that I am forbidden uh, to offer you monetary appraisal uh, if, if I think that the painting is real, I can't tell you how much it would be worth. Do you understand? Oh, yeah, I understand. I have no interest in the outcome of this at all. Okay. Um, once I've seen the painting, I will check one of two boxes. Either, yes, I do believe that the painting is authentic, or no, I do not believe it is. After that, a fully written um, report um, expressing my opinions as to the authenticity of the painting will be mailed to you from my New York office. Got it. You understand? Yep. I need you to sign right here. So tell me, how much do you think my painting could be worth. <laughs> Didn't you hear a single word I just said? <laughs> I heard. I am forbidden. I know. The foundation. I'm not asking this painting. Good. I'm asking a painting like it. No. Just in theory. I can't. Before you even see it. Mrs. Gutman. How much? Mrs. Gutman. Call me Marge. Mar I will not call you Maud. <laughs> oh, come on, how much? I don't know any other way to put this to Okay, okay, okay. I'm not asking about this painting. A painting like this, okay? What if? Conversation. Come on, please, be a person. Let me be clear. I'm not saying this painting 
Not this painting. No. But in theory. Yes. A painting like it. Yes. Well, if it is authentic, I'm saying if. Mm -hmm. The market value could be anywhere from 50 to 100 million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and I to understand that the painting is not signed by any art. No. Yes, and uh, so you know nothing of its provenance. It's what? It's provenance, the ownership prior to you. <laughs> Who the hell knows? See, you have no uh, documentation nor paper trail linking you and the painting back to any artist. Listen, pal. I don't even know the provenance of this thing I got on from the thrift store. I Forget see. the damn paint. I see. But that doesn't mean it isn't real. Yes, yeah, so uh, the identity of the artist is in question. Well, not in my mind. Yes, yeah, a precarious landscape to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> Tell again for the record um, how you came upon the painting. Well, I wrote that all down in there, how it happened. Indulge me. From the horse's mouth, huh? <laughs> I was hesitant to use a zoological reference. <laughs> well, in my own... Idiosyncratic vocabulary. Can I just get the damn painting? Please. Be a person. Okay, okay. But hold on to your hat, because this is unfreaking believable Okay? I am, uh... I'm a scavenger, okay, a pack rat. I'm always in thrift stores and, and junk shops and Salvation Army, you know, picking up bargains, buying stuff that other people throw away. You may find this shocking, but I've decorated my entire home this way. <laughs> Everything you see before you in this room is throwaway stuff, you know, crap that other people toss. Shit that I pull from the bottom of dumpsters. Imagine my surprise. <laughs> so about three years ago, I'm over at uh, Daisy's Junk Shop on Highway 80. I was looking for a set of shot glasses to go with that, um, that ice bucket that I pulled out of the garbage behind Lenny's Bar and Grill. The establishment that fired you. I quit. My mistake. So anyway, I'm in Daisy's and I see that She's got all these paintings leaning against the wall in the back, near the used paperback books. So, my dear friend Roberta, who lives in a trailer down the way. The one with the dogs? Yes. Well, it was her birthday the day before, and she was being a real sourpuss. Feeling all sorry for herself, feeling like an old maid. So, I figure I'll buy one of the paintings and I'll give it to her as a joke to cheer her up, okay? So I go into the stack, and I'm looking for the ugliest one. And I pull out this god-awful piece of shit. I'm thinking, man, that's ugly. So I go over to the counter. Daisy wants five bucks for it, but I say, do you see how ugly this thing is? Who else is going to buy it? I'll give you three. Well, she takes the three dollars. I throw the painting in the back of my truck. I drive back here laughing all the way home. <laughs> I give the painting to Roberta. She takes one look at it, goes ballistic. She doesn't want it. She wants nothing to do with it. So anyway, me and Roberta, we drank some beers. And then we, uh, well, then we drank some more. <laughs> and before you know it, we get my old 45 and we take the painting out back of her trailer. We're going to shoot it full of holes. But he get so shit faced, we can't find the bullets. So Roberta says, "Screw it." She throws it out in the street. She hates it. Slams the door. Goes inside. Now I'm stuck with it. Hey, are you sure you don't want a little? Uh... No, thank you. Okay. Well, a couple months after that, I'm having a yard sale. And I, I put the painting out in front of the trailer with some other, you know, junk that I'm trying to get rid of. <laughs> and Tom uh, Bucky, who's the art teacher at MacArthur High School, he comes by 
I think he was looking for an old frying pan or something, but he saw the painting. He goes over, picks it up, studies it for a long time, and then he calls me over. And he says, I may be wrong, but this could be a Jackson Pollock. And you had no idea who Jackson Pollock was. Not a freaking clue. <laughs> and now? Now I do. I do. Can I go get the painting now? Yes, you may go get the painting now. All right. It's tidy, concise. Well, that's good. No, that's bad. 
That's bad. Pollock was never tidy. Pollock was volcanic, on fire. But this, well, this is shallow, empty, has no allure. Look, I don't like the painting either, but that doesn't mean it's not real. Yes, but look at this. Yeah. And this here. Yeah. This here. And this. Pollock's work was always explosive. Each canvas was like a leap off of a cliff. Life or death. That's what made it so exciting and exhilarating. Well, this, though, it... Well, it has no peril, no danger. I look at it and I'm waiting. For what? The tingle. The tingle that I get when I'm standing in the presence of something authentic. Well, are you tingling? This is not a Jackson Pollock. I'm afraid I'm going to have to check the no on my form here. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you are not. I beg your pardon. You can't. I know what art is. Yeah, well, I like pictures too, okay? Just the same as you. <laughs> I mean, uh, look at this over here, huh? What about this? You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> What's the matter? That is not art. Well, it's more art than that. At least this looks like something. A painting is supposed to look like something, right? You look at this, and you know what it is. Yes, odious repugnancy. <laughs> I like it. It's art. This is ridiculous. If you're just going to contradict my findings, why did you apply for my approval in the first place? Because I need you to say that the painting is real. But it is not real. Every known Pollock is either in a museum or a private collection. Every known Pollock. You think a bartender from Baker Ex-bartender. Can walk into a junk store and for $3 buy a masterpiece worth $100 million. It happens. Where? The National Enquirer. <laughs> well, they, um, hey, they found all those Picassos in France, didn't they? And, uh, oh, and this guy here, he had a painting stashed behind the family sofa for 26 years. This guy here. Martin Cover. Yeah, Martin Cover. And it turned out to be a Michelangelo worth $3 million. They're doing infrareds and x-rays. The results have not proved anything. Look, good can finally hit a person. Can it? I mean, miracles happen sometimes, don't they? God can smile down on you one time in your freaking life and throw you a blessing. I'm not an expert on God. New York, on the other hand, will never approve of that painting or of you. What does that mean? It has no artistic no, 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 no. integrity. Approve of me? It has no aesthetic purpose. Look, I don't give a shit if New York approves of me. Well, there's a sigh of relief. <laughs> what, a person like me can't own a masterpiece? My evaluation is not of you. You don't want it to be a poet. <laughs> Nothing would thrill me more. Well, get happy, buddy, because that <laughs> painting is real. It is not real. It's a forgery. Oh, it's impossible to forge a Pollock. How would you know? Who else could paint crap like that? <laughs> Francis Hogan Brown. Who? Francis Hogan Brown. He was an abstract drip and splatter painter at a studio here in Palm Springs years ago. He, he copied tons of Pollock canvases. He sold a lot of them right here in this area, you know. And every so often they do turn up. When I was first assigned this assignment, I had suspected that this might be a brown. You know, proving forgeries is my passion. Now that I've examined it, I'm positive that it's a brown. This is a Pollock. I know it. I can feel it. It is a brown. It's real. It has to be. No, in fact, it doesn't have to be. I'm sorry to be the Grim Reaper. Sounder of the death knell. 
crushing your dreams of fame and fortune. I don't care about fame and fortune. Oh, really? One hundred million dollars. Think of the shot glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a shit about the money. Well, what do you give a shit about? The truth, you snooty son of a bitch! I see. Well, first off, you're going to have to learn to accept it. You'll excuse me, I'll take my pen and I'll finish this paperwork on the way to the airport. Have a nice day. Well, what if you're wrong? What? What if you're wrong? What would happen? Happen? Yeah, to you. What would happen to you? What do you mean, what would happen to me? Well, um, okay, let's say you, you fly back to New York and you tell the art world this painting is a forgery, it's a fake. It turns out to be real. The find of a century. You know, what would happen? I don't see your point. To you, what would happen to you? Nothing would happen to me. Well, maybe I need to get another expert. <laughs> be my guest. Go right ahead. I will. Do it. Survey the art world. You'll find out that my opinion is the only one that matters. <laughs> Not if you're wrong. <laughs> Again. What? Huh? What was that? Oh, you heard me. How dare you? I'm just saying. My standing in the art world is absolute impeccable. You've never been wrong. No. Never made a mistake? No. A wrong judgment, a wrong conclusion? Never. About anything? Not when it comes to art. <laughs> so who's not accepting the truth now? There is only one truth when it comes to art. Yours? Great art is the only truth. When the gods speak, it's... It's what? Never mind. No, 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 no. When the gods speak, it's... I am leaving. You'll receive my report in ten days. When have the gods ever spoken to you? I was 17. The Museum of Modern Art. A field trip. School. Go on. A field trip. School. I got off the bus, walked in, up the stairs, turned the corner, and, and there it was. What? Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon. It's this big, huge painting. The canvas attacked like some kind of primitive and savage blue, beige, and, and brown monstrosity. It was terrifying. I had no idea what I was seeing. That's ugly, I said to my friend. Then my teacher, Miss Pritchard, she put her hand on my shoulder, my left shoulder, right here. And she said to me, Lionel, nothing in the entire history of art is like it. It's the single most influential work of art ever created. She was right. until Pollock. Pollock stretched cubism and surrealism beyond recognition. But Picasso was suddenly a painter of the past. Pollock was modern art. He split the art world, no, the art universe, wide open. The splitting of an atom, the flash of a nuclear blast. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. He reconfigured the molecular structure of art. You look at his paintings and they rewire your retinas. Movement made infinite. No beginning or end. Each painting just is. Every great artist paints what he is. Pollock did not paint from nature. 
no Pollock said, I am nature, primitive and savage. Pollock said, I enter each painting as I paint it. He would lay the canvas across the floor like a lover, lean over it, straddle it, tease it, talk to it, mutter to it like a madman, whisper to it in dialogue with the painting, coaxing it, caressing it, tickling it, teasing it, and then enter it. Swirling lines, lines swirling and spattering and circling the canvas in a trance like a shaman. He drooled and dripped his unconscious. A panther on the prowl, the matador stalking the bull, knowing when to strike, and then the assault, violent and explosive, burst of brush, lariats of color, flinging paint like throwing dice, knowing how the paint would land. A swirling lines, a frenzy of, of lines that curve, that dance, that explode. Lines in teal and raspberry, yellow and arabesque of amethyst. No brush ever touching the canvas, no his, his body plus the brush. Bending paint to fall at his will, making art in the air. He drooled it, he spattered it, bleeding on the canvas, ejaculating, coming on canvas, painting his fever, art his ecstasy, white heat. Pollock, Pollock was Kerouac on canvas. The only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who burn, burn, burn like fabulous Roman candles exploding like spiders across the stars. And in the middle, you see the center blue light pop, and everybody goes, ah. Oh. <laughs> I beg your pardon. I, uh, I, I got a case of these that I, I took from Liddy's the last day I worked. You stole it? Severance pay. <laughs> Why did they fire you? Oh, no, I'm sorry. You quit. I was fired. Why? Because I tried to kill myself. myself a rum and coke and the painting was right where it is now like an old friend and I was talking to it like I do sometimes when I'm alone and all of a sudden the wind picks up outside gentle you know and those old beer bottle wind chimes they started to rattle and come to life and the sun ducked behind the cloud for a minute the sunlight in here began to shift and move. 
and the light from outside fell on the painting just a certain way, you know, and for a moment, for a moment it seemed almost nice, you know, kind of, kind of beautiful and alive. They say that in some of his drift paintings that Pollock actually urinated on them, peed on them while he was painting. <laughs> that bitch was crazy. <laughs> he drank too much. Well, he was angry and in pain, you know? Well, he had his demons. Don't we all? Did you really try to kill yourself? When a woman that Pollock was in love with suddenly died, he took a knife and he slashed up all of the paintings that he was working on at the time. A, a kind of suicide. Grabbed the shreds of canvas and just threw them out the window. The human heart can be... Hey. Hey, here's to me and here's to you. Here's to those we kiss and screw. Here's to them for screwing us over and here's to us for never being sober. <laughs> Your turn of phrase is certainly... Yeah. Maud the Broad is what my husband used to call me, among other things. With great affection, I've no doubt. Are you kidding? <laughs> that man made me and my boy feel like... You have a son? They drink up, down the hatch. Well, I, I, I shouldn't, I can't. Why not? Well, you know, I'm, I'm still working. All work and no play. It's, it's against the rules of professional conduct. Oh, rules schmools. I don't follow the rules, I break them. Look at me. My point exactly. <laughs> Look, do you think Jackson Pollock gave a shit about the rules? I'm not Jackson Pollock. Well, that's a fucking understatement. I, I'm sorry. Man. You know, I, I just... I say things and then shit comes out. My uh, my social skills really need polishing. I, I really shouldn't. Oh, come on. Mom's the word, okay? <laughs> this is not how foundation assignments are designed to unfold. Well. You may surprise yourself. Bottoms up. <laughs> I don't like surprises. Listen, have you ever Googled yourself? You know, your own name? No, I, I've never Googled myself. Oh, get out of here. No, I, I have. Really? <laughs> and I figured you were your own favorite subject. See, I did it again. Look, all I'm saying is, if you go to Google and you type in my name, you get nothing. Zippity doo dock. Me and my life, it has no results. You know, I, I don't exist. But you? Oh, boy. All kinds of shit comes up when you Google your name. You exist. I existed once. You know, me and my brother, we Googled you. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Kit and Caboodle. <laughs> All the way back to when you first started out a long time ago. Hmm. I believe that was called the Cretaceous period. <laughs> it was your first big break. Yes, I was a young curator at the Met. Modern art department. A little hot shot even then. 
my address book of dealers, collectors, artists, agents, and smugglers was legendary. <laughs> so how did you end up running the place? Well, the, uh, the museum director suddenly died one afternoon. How? A cerebral hemorrhage after a particularly brutal meeting with the board of trustees. Bomber. A committee was formed, chaired by the Ambergs and the Rockefeller Foundation. And they searched the entire globe for his successor. And you were chosen. I was 37. It was December. It was the best Christmas present I ever received. So that museum is, is like a really big freaking place, right? Onto the art world. The Metropolitan is like the Vatican. Out of touch with reality? <laughs> No, a temple of the human spirit, a palace of the soul, a cathedral housing 5,000 years of the artistic expression of man. So if the museum is like the Vatican, then that made you, what, the Pope? For a while, <laughs> yes, I was the Pope of Fifth Avenue. Hmm, to be the director of the Metropolitan Museum, one has to be part Pope, part used car salesman, <laughs> part gunslinger, publicity whore, art collector, smuggler, and Papa Bear to the staff of, oh, I don't know, 800? Where did you learn to do all that? I made it up as I went along flying off to exotic sites, ancient tombs, murky catacombs, discovering the most magnificent treasures. You were Indiana Jones! <laughs> <laughs> but with a much bigger expense account. <laughs> Lord and ruler of the art universe. Yeah. Mm, they were the best years of my life. Yeah, until the end, <coughs> when they fired you. I resigned. <laughs> <laughs> it was years ago. My mistake, but um, why'd you leave? I committed the greatest sin in the museum business. What was that? I cared about art. When one enters the museum business, one must enter it like entering the priesthood to serve a higher power. See, a work of art is a physical thing expressing the non-physical. The, the beyond spiritual. You see, great art has spiritual power embedded within it. Power to heal the heart save and uplift the human soul and spirit. I don't know. I read somewhere that they fired you. <laughs> the museum wanted ever more media grabbing events. <laughs> Stores, merchandise, merchandise. They wanted met stores in Bloomingdale's. Art became Product. And I would have no part of that, so I left. You were fired. They fired you over that boy. That naked young man, didn't they? That, um, that statue. It's called Kuros. Whatever. It's an ancient Greek statue. 530 BC, Dolomitic marble from a quarry in Solaria, uh, an island in the North Aegean. And you had the museum buy it for millions. Yes, but it was glorious. Freestanding, six foot, nine inches tall, nude, 
arms at the sides, hands clenched into fists, eyes straight ahead, left foot forward, striding forth in nobility, strength, the quintessence of youth was the ideal of Greek culture. Arete. Huh? Arete. It's ancient Greek for something true, something beautiful and good. Courage and strength in the face of adversity. Virtue without flaw. But this one had a flaw. It wasn't that it had a flaw. It was that it was a forgery. <laughs> we all have flaws. A fake. <clears throat> that statue was a major find. Or a very expensive mistake. But I knew it. I knew it from the beginning. Marble analysis, isotopic signatures, they prove nothing. And that statue is still standing there in that same spot today on display. But you're not. I was made an example of. You were fired. I wasn't wrong. I I was betrayed. By the statue? Art is silent. It's the people who... Yeah. I was eviscerated by the New York Times. Archbishop of Art defrocked crucified for the sins of my brothers. Do you have any idea how many fakes are on display being touted as real? Oh, I don't believe what you hear. There is bogus paperwork on every major piece of art that exists. Nobody's hands are clean. So why didn't you fight back? I did. I wrote a letter of outrage to Art Forum magazine. Oh, give me a freaking break. <laughs> what would you know about it? Well, I know that there comes a time in life when you've got to stand up for yourself and take control. You know, life is like... Life is like sex. You can lay back and get screwed. Or you can get on top and ride the hell out of it. <laughs> I fail to see how your analogy... Pertains. Don't let the assholes push you around, okay? When you know you're right, never quit. Don't start with me. My wife tore into me, thank you very much, day in and day out. I was weak, I was self-destructing. She sounds like a real keeper. She was... Yeah, I know. You think a person's one thing and it turns out they're not. Years before all of this happened, one morning, my wife brought home this ancient Chinese urn she acquired from a dealer. She just adored ancient pottery. <laughs> my idea of ancient pottery is the Tupperware I still have from 1981. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this Chinese urn, it was 960 BC, unglazed stenephorous enamel. I knew it was a fake the moment that I saw it. Look, the shape, the typography, it was all wrong. You know, I have a sixth sense about these things. So I told my wife to remove it. She said, no. It didn't matter to her if it was real or not. Nobody would know the difference. She displayed it anyway against my orders in the center, the very center of our home. This thing, this object, on a white alabaster pedestal, it was a lie. I couldn't even go into the living room anymore. I, I had to find alternate ways to get into the kitchen. Every time I entered that living room, it was like taking a dagger and stag stabbing it in my... So, uh, <clears throat> so you and the wifey, are you still... Uh... She was revealed to be less than what I had appraised her to be. <laughs> Ouch. Oftentimes, things that we think are superior turn out to be bogus. A real work of art lives, but a fake, 
it's dead. Oh, it fools you for a while. But after living with it day in and day out, soon the fakeness, it, it becomes hateful. And what about the real thing? One is uplifted and, and, and <laughs> blessed by the person that created it. You know, in, in my many years at the Met, I must have examined 50,000 works of art of all different, all different kinds. 40% were fake. Forgery is as old as art itself. The world wants to be fooled. Except you. I was fooled once, but never again. That painting is real. It is fake. So you're gonna you're gonna check the no box on your little form? Absolutely. Are you sure there isn't anything I could do to change your mind? I beg your pardon? Why don't you tell your driver to get lost and circle the block a few times? What are you suggesting? Well, I'm suggesting that maybe all you need is a little convincing. Oh my are you out of your mind? <laughs> What's the matter? You're drunk. <laughs> I better be drunk. <laughs> you think I'd smoke your pole sober? <laughs> You're in the most cruel and vulgar woman that I've ever come in contact with. I need with. you to say that that painting is real. Never. Say it. I can't. I'd be lying. So lie. I have a higher moral standard than you do. Oh, bite me. Bite you. That painting is a major find. That painting is empty, worthless. Says the ex-museum director. I have expert intuition. Man, your intuition is no better than mine. Ha! Huh. Really, what kind of intuition could you possibly have? Well, I get sudden flare-ups. <laughs> We're not talking hot flashes. <laughs> I get hunches and gut feelings to you, asshole. Oh, lovely. You know, I can sense things, same as you. It's just common sense. It's common being the operative word. I'm smarter than you think. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> How much... Higher education have you had? None of your damn business. You're uninformed. I know what I know. Listen, this painting will never be real just because you want it to be. You are ignorant and a fool. I am not stupid. Yes, you are. For believing in something that you have no understanding of. I'm done. You know, I was... I was watching Law and Order with my friend Howard in here Gutman. about a year ago. Mrs. Gutman more fit. Howard is retired. He uh he used to be a detective in San Bernardino. Mrs. Gutman, I'm and, leaving. And I had already mailed in my application to your foundation. I was waiting to hear back. You'll receive the paperwork in ten days. So I've known Howard a long time, ever since his wife died and, and he moved in out here. And Howard is a gentleman. Okay, he's never laid a hand on me, never made a move on me. All right? Imagine the self-restraint. <laughs> so anyway, we watch Law and & Order. And Howard can always figure out who did it by the second commercial. He, he's a genius. Mrs. Gutman. So anyway, Howard was over here about a year ago. And he and I were watching Law and & Order. And I said to him, I gotta find a way to prove this painting is a Pollock. And he said, treat the painting like a homicide. Okay? So, he gets his magnifying glass and he walks over to the painting and I said, what the hell are you doing? He said, rule one in homicide, examine the body. So it goes like this. Mrs. Gutman. Up and down. Mrs. Gutman. 
Uh, Mrs. Gutman! Get down. It seemed like hours. You're telling me. Do you know what he found? I have no idea. Nothing. Not a damn thing. Mrs. Gutman, I'm done playing this game of charades with you. But then, he turned the painting around. Like this. And that's when he spotted that. <laughs> and what is that supposed to be? That is a fingerprint. The fingerprint of Jackson Pollock. <laughs> it's not. It is. <laughs> how do you know? Well, Howard's a connoisseur. An elderly beer swilling twiddler from San Bernardino is hardly a fingerprint expert. Okay, so then he, Howard goes home and he comes back with all these um, weird scientific tools, okay? He brought a microscope, he brought a scalpel to take paint scrapings, he had tweezers and all kind of stuff. This is Howard's report. The painting was executed in high level gloss emulsion enamel. The kind and Pollock acrylic used. resin paint. The on kind stretch Pollock white cotton used. canvas also the called. The kind would you, Pollock. Would you stop that? <laughs> I collected four scrapings of paint from the folded over edge of the canvas with a surgical probe for later analysis. I collected six samples of hair and fiber embedded in the paint layer. The hair samples appeared to be human, dark brown in color. The fingerprint was discovered on the verso. That means the back. <laughs> it was deposited with a fingertip that was coated in paint of various colors. Howard also brought a, a, a fancy camera. Uh, the, the print was photographed by a high-powered digital camera with a macro lens at a one-to-one -one reproduction ratio with a medical ring flash unit. This is Howard's photo of the fingerprint. It could be anybody's. But it's not. <laughs> there is no record of Jackson Pollock's print. I know that. He was never arrested, so they've never taken any fingerprints. I'm sure there's a few times he probably should have been arrested. So then Howard and I went to my brother's house. And my brother showed me the website for the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's in New York City. <laughs> and on the website, if you click on archives, they have all these high-res digital photos of famous paintings, you know, so, so art students can study them. It's very fascinating. You can zoom in really, really close and see each tiny brush stroke, you know, each micro dot of paint from the website. Lavender Mist. Pollock's painting. It's famous, right? Yes. He actually got down on his hands and knees when he painted it, put his hands right in the paint. Well, on the website, if you zoom in on this painting, super duper close, right about there, you will see this. Okay? Come this way, you'll learn something. <laughs> So we have the fingerprint from my painting, mm -hmm. the fingerprint from Lavender Mist, wait for it, that, huh, look at that, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Twelve characteristics of the two fingerprints appear identical, yeah. twelve bifurcations, three small islands, and two ridge endings. The correspondence of 12 characteristics is confirmation that Pollock's fingerprint on lavender mist was left by the same finger as the fingerprint on the painting. They are one and the same. <laughs> I simply don't believe it. What do you mean? I don't believe it. How can you not believe I it? I choose. Not to believe well, it? Well, you have to believe it. What is that fingerprint supposed to mean? It's the fingerprint of Jackson Pollock. So you think, you don't know. It's the same as the one on his famous painting. Tell me, what are you trying to do with all of this anyway? 
What are you trying to do? This fingerprint business? Are you trying to set me up or trap me? No! No! You just offered me sex. What do you call no, no, that? No, 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 no. Look, I just wanted you to come in and, and say the painting was real without me influencing you, okay? Influencing The offer of sex was just a little encouragement. <laughs> Listen, who, whomever fingerprint this is, it can't be shown that it's Jackson Pollock's Beyond Shadow of a Doubt. If you want to submit fingerprint expert, then you have to hire someone who is certified, recognized by the international art community. An expert. That's right. Well, I don't have money to hire a fancy guy like that. Well, then as you and Howard might say, you're shit out of luck. <laughs> Not if you do it. <laughs> do what? Get the fingerprint expert. I can't do that. Oh, you must know a shitload. Yeah, you make the phone call right I'm now. I'm afraid that's not possible. Oh, sure it is. Here, here. I you, am you not use going my to phone. do that. You, you can use my phone. It don't be scared. It's, it works. Mrs. You Jackman, just... I have a phone. Well, get on that sucker, pal. <laughs> Start dialing the foundation. And tell them what? To get the fingerprint specialist, one certified and approved, and get his ass over here. That is not the way this works. Well, how does this work? The onus is on you. The Foundation will not pay for proper testing for every case that comes along. My painting is not every case. Not to you. The Foundation sees your case otherwise. To be more accurate, they will never see it at all. Don't you want to know the truth? I already know it. We'll prove it. Make the call. Get the experts. I will not further involve the Foundation. Look, if it's a fake, case closed, what have you got to lose? I will not jeopardize my standing with the Foundation to entertain your masquerade You're of... You're scared! Of what? That your fingerprint specialist will prove you wrong. You care more about your damn reputation than the truth. That is professionally insulting and absurd. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I being impolite? Well, how's this? All you art assholes are the same. Every last one of you. What do you mean, all? Well... Oh, hello. Uh, Knight, uh, Knightbridge uh, Art Gallery. Look, I've got a masterpiece by Jackson Pollock that I bought in a junk shop, and I click. Oh, hello, Crispin Weiss, Fine Art Boutique. I know this is going to sound crazy, but I have a long lost Jackson Pollock that I bought in a junk shop, and I click. Even the asshole from Arabella Art Gallery, he came over. He saw the painting. I showed him the fingerprint. He stood right where you're standing now. And what did he say? That I was out of my mind. Case closed. But he's wrong. <laughs> Look, I don't understand. What am I doing here? You are my last chance. You're my only hope. You're looking for hope where there is none. Don't you believe in anything? Yes, I believe in my scholarship, my learning, my aesthetic eye, my expertise. I believe in that deep inner voice that tells me when I'm standing in the presence of something authentic or something fake. Yeah, well, I hear voices too, you know. <laughs> no doubt. And it's still just your opinion. Yes, but my opinion matters. Yours does not. Fine! Fine! <sighs> what are you doing with that knife? Does it matter? Mrs. Gutman, no, 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 no. knife down. I'm unimportant, right? I, I amount to nothing. Mrs. Gutman. You know, my husband used to say to me, Mom, you ain't nothing but a waste of skin. You've never done nothing worth doing in this life, and ain't nobody gonna miss you when you're gone. And he was right. You said the same. 
pain thing. I didn't say you anything. said me and the pain Mr. both of us are worthless. Put the knife worthless you're job. Going to Without hell, you know no reason to, to exist. Hurt. So what the hell? I'm gonna slash it up. No, I will cut got it to pieces. Got 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 get your hands off me! I can't stand this anymore. Give me the hands off me! I can't stand this anymore. Oh my goodness. You do think it's oh. real, don't you? I think I'm having a heart attack. <laughs> God, I'm too old for all of this. I have a bad back. Oh. You see something white and round rolling around the floor, it's probably my vertebrae. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy woman! Yeah, well, put Pollock in a crazy asylum. Why not me? Mess. Don't even worry about it. It's all junk, right? It's all worthless well. junk. But not that. Give me that. What is it? That's my boy Eddie. Isn't he handsome? Yes. I know all mothers think their sons are handsome. How old is he in that picture? Uh, 19. How old is he now? Do you have any? No. My wife and I decided, well, she wanted them, but I was hesitant. Why? Well... Having children would have required... Having sex with your wife? Well, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> My parents... They divorced when I was five. Parents. The wrong parents. The wrong parent can destroy a boy's belief in himself. I know. You know, nothing was easy for my Eddie. Not even when he was a little kid. Reading, writing. Everyday life was a struggle for him. My boy was born with too big an engine inside him, you know, too... too big a heart for this world such a sensitive boy. When I would go to the market or, or be gone someplace and when I came back he would always run up to me, Mommy, Mommy, did you miss me? He always looked up to me, you know, he wanted my approval. We had this thing when he was a boy. Me and my Eddie. boy it's like your heart is outside your body walking around and his father his father was a mean son of a bitch when he was drinking which was always wild drunk and start shit with Eddie and pick on him and call him all kind of things. Tell him he was dumb. He wasn't dumb. He was he was different. But when the man you look up to tells you you're nothing every day of your life, you can't help but grow up believing that. I 
I know. I know. The picture that I'm forming of your husband isn't altogether a very nice one. Oh, well. He was something when I married him. He was good looking and, and talked a good game. He, oh, he knew better than everybody. Smarter, superior. He just knew he was going places. Turned out the only place he went was the corner bar and that couch. He'd sit there every day getting drunk watching the hunting channel. Marrying me and having Eddie ruined his life. And now he's gone. One day he just grabbed up his shit and left. It's the happiest day of my life. Standing outside this trailer with my boy watching the dust from that man's pickup get smaller and smaller until he disappeared down Highway 12. The damage was done. Eddie was 22, hurt, angry, drunk most of the time, beer in the morning and bourbon at night. He was a wild one, always wrestling with, with himself. Always a scowl on his face like he was looking into a hard driven rain. He'd just sit here day after day and not say nothing to nobody. Not even to me. There was a storm inside my boy. A storm like that. Like that there, my Eddie somewhere in there. And then one day he, he drank a six pack of Coors and he stumbled out the door and got into his black Mustang and revved up the engine and took off. Gone. They found his body twisted up in the wreckage. His neck was broken. The car crumpled up on the side of the highway like an empty pack of cigarettes. And everything just goes black. You can't see nothing. It's like falling in a black hole. Down, 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 gone. And you can't get out. You know, I read in an art book one time that white is the absence of color. You probably knew that. <laughs> White is the absence of color, but black? Black is every color, all the colors, all mixed together at once. Everything becoming, becoming nothing. The last year of his life, Pollock only painted in black, his only color. All that color gone. And then he got into his Oldsmobile and he stepped on the gas. No. <laughs> oh my God. You know, me and Roberta never did find the bullets to this thing. <laughs> oh my god, you knew there were no bullets in there. There will be one day. Oh, oh, oh my god, 
you, you did this on purpose. I scared you, didn't I? <sighs> My first impression of you was totally wrong. I misjudged you completely. You see? You blink and you miss me. <laughs> Tell me now what my painting is worth. You know that I can't give you a monetary appraisal. Well, it don't matter. I already got one. What? An appraisal? An offer. What? For the painting, somebody wants to buy it. Who? Some businessman in India. How did he hear about it? From my brother, online, behind my back. You have an offer, a legitimate offer. Well, oh, I'd say it's legitimate. I've got the letter in that top left drawer there. No questions asked. He's not requiring any paperwork. No. Nope. No authenticity of any sort. No, he'll just buy it. Cash. Done. Boom. That's the offer. Oh my god, this this is incredible. Well, that's the offer. And, and what did you say to him? I haven't. Why not? My god, this is two million dollars. But it's worth so much more. But Mrs. Goodman, this Look, Jackson Pollock never settled, no matter what, not even when he was broke, and neither will I. But Mrs. Goodman, this is two million dollars. You could buy it. This is not about the money. But it never was. You can buy a house, move somewhere nice. Why are you putting yourself through all this? I have no choice. I never did. One day my boy is gone. And then one afternoon this thing shows up. I didn't find the painting. The painting found me. And the world needs to know its true worth and its true value. I've seen this through the end, okay? I can't explain why. Some things you can't put in words. I'm not an expert, but isn't that what art is supposed to do? Yes. Yes, it is. Mrs. Kevin, you realize that you can't fight this forever. Your window of opportunity will soon close. That's why I need you. Please, I am begging you. I need your blessing. Blessing from the Pope. Give the painting your blessing and say that it's real. The Rand Corporation, they did this experiment. They took world-class violinist Joshua Bell they dressed him up in, in, in homeless clothes. And they put him and his $3.5 million Stradivarius violin down in the subway. Tim cup at his feet. He played Bach. The most intricate pieces of music ever written. He played them beautifully all day long. Do you know what people did? Brushed right past him. Didn't look, never noticing. Not realizing that they were missing the most glorious music ever written, played by the most talented violinist alive. People, people don't know anything. 
Not even you. Take the two million dollars. Are you going to mark your form now? Yes, I am. Well, well, what's it going to be? Yes or no? I'm sorry, Mrs. Gethin, but the painting is not authentic. But you? Arate. You didn't need an expert to tell you that. Just get out. Get out! 